0.048 becquerels per kilogram. Her and her daughter measured 0.035 and 0.036 becquerels per kilogram, which is 18 times that of normal levels because they had evacuated. I think it makes sense that there's were lower. And finally, a girl who evacuated with her mother from Fukushima, but who decided to return to Fukushima. When they measured her urine, it actually measured 100 times higher than the normal levels of 0 0.2 becquerels per kilogram. So they will come like So fundamentally, it should be their right to, to, to evacuate. It should also be their right to choose the same foods that to eat. And however, um, in March 2017, next year, they will be cutting um, housing subsidies so that people like um, Matsumoto-san, who are voluntary evacuees, simply because they were outside of the evacuation zone, which is set way too high to begin with, people like that who are barely you know, living like double lives with one one house for their husband in Fukushima, one for the other evacuees, etc. They will be led into poverty if they start to just cut these subsidies. So these are what I wanted to come here to tell you about. I wanted to tell you that we definitely believe the importance in our right to live, our right to evacuate, and that the government is really not doing its part. Thank you. After the 311 earthquake, Japan declared its declaration of nuclear emergency and used that as an excuse to suddenly raise all sorts of um, maximum exposure limits from food, uh, playgrounds, everything. So after the earthquake, they used that excuse to increase the exposure limit from uh, 1 to 20, for example, and various other maximum uh, limits. But this doesn't make sense. Uh, emergency measures should cannot just be changed once the emergency actually happens. You can't tell people, OK, this is what we'll do in, in case of an emergency. Once it happens, completely change your mind, say it's actually OK up to here. And what is even worse is that the state has now taken that raised upper limit and um, we base everything on that now. The emergency is ongoing, but it's pretending like it's back to normal and changing all sorts of other things based on that new upper arbitrary limit. So what the government is now proposing is it's kind of similar to what you were mentioning earlier about the reuse, recyclage of materials. And um, what it's proposing now is because during the emergency they decided that it's okay to multiply the, up, um, the limit by 80 times, they're saying, okay, now we can use materials, soil, everything, that is 80 times more contaminated than what was allowed before the earthquake to be spread everywhere, all over Japan to share the poison. But of course, if the state wants to claim that it's back to a normal state, then they should also re reduce the lim limit to 180th, like what it was before 311. Instead, they're just taking this rate, and they are intending to dump it, because in reality, they just don't know where else to put all the cleaned up soil from decontamination efforts that are just piling up in the I really don't know exactly how many zeros of thousands of tons or I don't know. So these are some of the recent crazy things that the state has been doing. And I think, so that's what Ms. Obada wanted to present to you. And we will now move on to Mr. Elmukov.
Thank you. Any questions? Let's take the questions now. We've got you up here. Okay. Well, Ol 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 Ol's going to talk next. But first. I think he already on. Already kind of talked about four actions. Yeah, but would you repeat them, please? Because the people in this room are not the same right. as the people who were there before. I think they should hear about the four actions. Is there a way for us to project? Um, we wrote a resolution. Yeah. Okay. Do you think I can implement that? So. Can we do the questions while this is going on? Some questions. Any, any questions? Uh, he has a question. Um, I understand there are big, big bags of radioactive waste from digging up the soil and cleaning up around the houses, but then um, they don't have anywhere to put it, and then the rain comes down from the mountains and it gets contaminated again, and yeah. that they're actually bringing the, some of the materials that are radioactive to incinerators and burning them around the country. Can you tell us if that's true and whether that's still going on and if it can be stopped. I also heard a um, professor was opposing the incineration and somebody put him in jail. Do you know about that? Uh, uh, could you please say the second question again? The one about somebody, the, the incineration? Somebody yeah. may have been put in jail for trying to oppose professor. the incineration was opposing incineration of radioactive waste all over Japan, and he was put in jail. Well, let's, let's go from, so to, uh, he is from, <laughs> he, so to answer the, uh, to answer for the first question, the answer is yes, the contaminated stuff has been uh, uh, scattered all over the Japan and uh, uh, the burned out in the, some institutions. And for the second question, the answer is no. And uh, as long as they know, uh, there is no professor who has been okay. arrested for that. Thank you. Okay, well, why don't we go to you? With, you've got this queued up. Um, because we wanted to return, they wanted to return to Japan with something, um, not just come and talk about what's going on in Fukushima, but we were hoping that I would like, get your advice to help us write a resolution so that we can try to I don't know, get support. It. Yeah, get support, get signatures, like a petition kind of thing. So it's at the bottom. Bottom left, yeah. regulation to save people's health, lives, and livelihoods from radioactive disasters. Voluntary members of the network to evacuate people from radioactivity, August 8, 2016. General statements. One, recognize the absolute need to decrease the post 311 maximum permissible annual dose of 20 millisievelt back to 1 millisievelt the minimum and unequivocal right of citizens affected by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster to evacuate based on this limit and to prescribe a domestic law to protect this right. Two, citizens worldwide recognize that the rights to evacuate based on the universal one millisievel limit as a universal right to be ensured for all world citizens. Establish this in an international treaty and apply this to protect the rights of current and future generations of people who suffer from nuclear disasters. Three, measures taken by the perpetrators of this nuclear accident were, one, to conceal information, two, increase various dosage limits and three, understate 
the magnitude of the disaster, which consequently endangered the lives and health of a vast population of citizens exposed to radiation. This constitutes a crime against humanity as defined by international humanitarian law and should be punished by the International Court of Justice. Four, the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster is the worst man-made disaster in Japanese history, as well as the worst outcome of a capitalistic economy for which the Japanese government has neither, uh, has neither the will nor the financial means to save. We must recognize that establishment of the solidarity economy and social economy formed by independent Mutual aid organizations is the only way to save victims suffering from illnesses and poverty. And then, and then this goes to specific statements. Okay. Uh, the Human Rights Declaration above supports that one, terminating housing subsi sub subsidies for voluntary evacuees by federal and local governments after March 2017 violates. Statements 1 and 2 of the Human Rights Declaration above and that the federal and local governments must therefore uh, retract this decision. Repeal, retract, repeal, withdraw. or withdraw this decision. Withdraw. Okay. Withdraw. Okay. Two, the Japanese government has the obligation to ensure ensure evacuees living standards appropriate for the above mentioned rights of evacuation and should immediately fulfill its obligations. Okay. Okay. Do we have a copy that people can sign here? Okay, I'll go print it out. But before that, I just wanted to ask for any kind of feedback will be appreciated because I don't think, I don't know if Tosho san has written it before, but I've never translated one. I want to just ask for any kind of feedback. Do you think it's valid enough? Robert suggested the word withdrawal okay. be used. I have not moved forward. There are there are a few very small errors. If you just give me a piece of paper, I can correct well, it's not very okay. important. Though. Yeah, I know. I'll just write it down. I would like to suggest um, that where you're recommending the one millisievert, mm -hmm. that you do it in a way that it's less than one millisievert, but in no case more, because even that amount is really not an acceptable level, and you don't want to get people all signing on to saying it's legal or that it's supported um, another high level. So, I would rephrase the millisievert to a way. I think they're talking about the evacuation cutoffs. They're saying that if, if it's over one millisievert, people have the right to evacuate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for, with compensation. That's what it's Yeah, about. and I'm saying that it should say um, one millisievert and possibly less. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 So we'll be able to sign on to this. Okay. Um, uh, at four o'clock, I think there's a general assembly, um, and I'm not sure what room that's in. It's in the Moss Building. In the Moss Building, uh, Angela. The conversion assembly. But we're not ready to go to that. We still have an hour. Um, are there any other questions for, for our friends from Japan? Uh, way, back, way back, Mark. Gordon? I would just like uh, there, there were there were four actions that the gentleman, uh, the lawyer, our friend, I'm sorry, I don't, can't say his name. But there were four actions that he brought forward the other day, and I just thought he could repeat what those four actions are. It's not. It's different from this. Um, excuse me. The four actions that uh, this gentleman. The four actions. Could he say what the four yes, actions are? Yeah. Oh, uh, my mistake. She, she, well, she, we're waiting on interpreter. Okay. So that's she's multitasking. So that's that's the. Bob. 
She has a comparing order. It's not a comparing order. There were four actions that discussed earlier in the week. Could, could you? Could you bring that up? Okay, sure. We, we've got some more presenters. Uh, Gordon's going to read those four actions from our friends from Japan. And then we'll go to all. Anderson? Gordon? Our, our friends from Japan are coming to the World Social Forum to ask for support uh, for four actions. Um, and I'll just read uh, what is written here. The Fukushima nuclear accident is the worst human-made disaster in human history, as well as the worst possible outcome of a capitalist economy, leaving hundreds of thousands in Fukushima still suffering. But we are convinced another world is possible, which of course is the motto of the World Social Forum, and so too is another form of relief by taking the following four actions. One, the enactment of a Japanese version of the Chernobyl legislation. Two, Adoption and ratification of an international human rights convention based on the Chernobyl legislation, basing our model on the Ottawa Treaty below. Three, pursuit of criminal responsibility, filing a joint international complaint on the crime against humanity against the Japanese government responsible for the nuclear accident. And four, reconstructing the lives of impoverished evacuees by establishing creative and mutually supportive independent citizens' organizations to promote a social and solidarity economy. Uh, so uh, I think that we can arrange to have this put on the World Social Forum website, uh, maybe on the Nuclear Forum website, with the necessary background information about the Chernobyl legislation and the Ottawa Treaty that is mentioned here. And that way people can go to the Facebook page or the, or the website page. Oh, Jack, which one would be better? Facebook. The Facebook page is the best. If you go to the Facebook page for the nuclear farm, uh, then you will find this, these four actions with the necessary documents attached to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Okay. Sorry. Ole Henderson, uh, who's been keeping an eye on Chalk River and keeping us informed behind the scenes, is going to come up and present. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief and, you, and Gordon will give a brief introduction of his good friend, Ole. Yeah. Uh, Ole lives quite close to uh, the oldest nuclear establishment in Canada, which is called the Chalk River Nuclear Establishment. The establishment of this uh, place was decided in Washington, D.C. in 1944 as a military decision as part of the World War II atomic bomb project. It was decided to build a nuclear reactor at Chalk River for the purpose of producing plutonium for bombs. And it was the outgrowth of research done here in Montreal at a secret laboratory into the best ways of producing plutonium. And it was that study that gave rise to the Canadian nuclear industry. But they have at Chalk River a very large and venerable uh, nuclear research establishment with many facilities with all kinds of nuclear waste of every description, solid, liquid, and so on. And Ole uh, lives close by and has a good, uh, to give a, a, a summary of what is going on there. Thank you all. Thank you, Gordon. And that's, that was an excellent introduction. As Gordon says, the history of, of Chalk River dates back to the Manhattan Project to produce nuclear weapons. And um, many activities have taken place, um, including the development of Canada's domestic uh, nuclear reactor program, which is based on heavy water reactors, reactors which have have uh, deuterium heavy water, which, um, as was noted earlier, easily picks up an extra neutron, becomes tritiated water, and tritium, as we know, is a, is, is a uh, hazard because of its mobility and its the ease with which it is in incorporated <laughs> as a radioactive form of water into our, our living tissues. And also it has a 12 and a half year half-life. Um, so at Chalk River, um, the first major reactor was the NRX reactor, originally built in the late 1940s. And it had a significant meltdown in 1952. Probably, I guess that was the worst meltdown that had occurred to that uh, time in, in the history of nuclear power. Um, 
to the extent that the Canadian government was aware that uh, if the public heard about that accident, that the, the, the future of nuclear power would be in jeopardy. So the accident was concealed, the reactor vessel was, was taken, and a large hole was dug right on site, and the reactor vessel was buried with um, a lot of worker exposure in the process, and a new vessel was built in the same location, again, with more worker exposure because the surrounding concrete was also quite radioactive. So that's the NRX reactor. It was um, decommissioned about 10 years ago. There was a second reactor called the NRU reactor, which is well known because of its history in producing what are known as medical isotopes. Um, and most of us have heard about medical isotopes, but few people know that medical isotopes were at least initially largely produced in, at Chalk River in the NRU reactor with the feedstock being highly enriched bomb grade uranium-235, which was shipped from the United States from the Savannah River site up the Chalk River, left in the NRU reactor for a period of a week or two. And then uh, the, the molybdenum-99, one of the fission products from uranium decay, is, was extracted from that. And then um, in the past 15 years has been then shipped to Ottawa for a profit-making company called Nord Nordion to send to hospitals um, around the world, and particularly in North America. So that NRU reactor, which was funded and subsidized by taxpayers, was doing the dirty business end of producing these medical isotopes for the profit-making company. And that's been a history of, of Chalk River, is that the Canadian taxpayers have poured uh, billions of dollars into this nuclear facility, and a lot of the profits from that facility have been then funneled into private sector profit-making companies. Uh, when the NRX melted down in 52, it, it left a great amount of, of contaminated uh, soils. The, the reactor vessel is still buried and water passes through that reactor vessel and, and cesium and strontium leach out of that um, and enter the Ottawa River which is a tributary of the St. Lawrence and flows into the into Montreal. So there's a massive amount of what's called nuclear legacy liabilities which are the responsibility of the, the government and taxpayers of Canada. So um, recently, last year, to try to speed up the cleanup, in theory, of, of some of the radioactive legacies at Chalk River, the facility was, um, is still owned by taxpayers, but now a consortium of private profit-making companies from the United States, Canada, and, and the United Kingdom are operating this facility. And their mandate in, is threefold. It's to uh, continue some science work, it's to clean up the liabilities, and it's to generate profits for, for these companies. Um, and one of the, the new developments in terms of generating profits is that um, uh, there has just been announced a proposal to, to make the largest commercial nuclear waste disposal facility probably in Canada and maybe in, in North America, right on that Chalk River site. Unfortunately, that site is within a few hundred meters of the Ottawa River. On um, The Ottawa River itself is an ancient earthquake fault. It's still seismically active and the rock there is, is, is fractured and, and porous. So um, this is not a brand new proposal in, in past um, there have been efforts to create large nuclear waste disposal facilities at Chalk River, but this is the latest attempt and it's, it's going to be very hard to stop this, this new effort um, because of the amount of, of profits that could potentially be generated for these four companies, Atkins in, in the UK, C2HM, um, uh, uh, SNC Lavalin, and um, uh, there's one other, 
Um, so um, this is now undergoing a federal environmental assessment, but very quietly and very quickly, it's, it's hoped that uh, a nuclear waste facility that would house as much as a million cubic meters of low-level waste can be constructed next to the Ottawa River at, at Chalk River. Um, initially, I had heard from the, the new uh, operating, the new management team, that, that this facility would be mostly used for cleaning up the existing leaking waste, like coming from the Barry NRX reactor vessel. But, but the latest we've heard, thanks to um, a tour that that's, I went on with some colleagues that some of you will know, Bernane Lloyd and Teresa McClenahan, we've learned that, that no, actually a lot of the leaking waste that are on there are, are hope that the, um, the new management team would simply like to declare those as in situ disposal areas and use the majority of the new facility for commercial bringing in other waste from elsewhere. So this is going to, uh, I think, trigger some uh, significant level of opposition once the word gets out that, that this is really the main purpose. This is the largest amount of this new waste facility would be devoted not to cleaning up the, the problems at Chalk River, but to bringing in waste from elsewhere. And, and um, I, I was asking Angela about whether you've talked about the uh, the Bruce, the, the um, DGR, the okay. geological repository, I think that's on your agenda for tomorrow. This site would be big enough to take all the waste um, that would have gone in the Bruce site. So if, as Teresa pointed out, potentially if the Bruce facility is, is, scrubbed. is scrubbed, then perhaps they would try to bring uh, at least a significant amount of the Ontario power generation waste up to Chalk River. That's a, that's a possibility now. Just the low level? Just low, but not intermediate level. But what we found is that there's also a proposal for a cavern, an intermediate level cavern, much like the DGR at Bruce at Chalk River. Um, despite the fact that, as I say, the, the rocks are totally unsuitable and it's be, it would be a, a very close to the Ottawa River and would inevitably leak into the Ottawa River. Um, one of the communities that's part of their consent based Siding for us, no, 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 um, no. And and this was not even for high level waste, but right. anything short of high level. Wow. The intermediate level waste would go into a, a cavern. The lower level waste would go into this million cubic meter, basically surface mound. Maybe you should uh, make it clear that this is a federal thing as opposed to a provincial thing. So that, like when we talk about the Lake Huron thing, it's provincial waste, whereas these are federal waste. And also, if you could just mention the terms of the Nuclear Legacy Liabilities Program and the price tag of the whole thing, maybe. Yeah, well, what the, the federal department, as, as, as Gordon says, this is, a, this is federal land, it's a federal facility. Um, uh, these are federal waste, but, the, but the, with the environmental assessment, there is no restriction to federal waste. They, no. There's the reference to commercial waste. So. Um, um, uh, the Nuclear Legacy Liabilities um, Program terminated two years ago when the um, switchover was made from a government-owned and government-operated facility to a government-owned and privately operated facility. So um, what was Atomic Energy of Canada Limited is now a very small organization but that very small organization will is awarding the contract to these four private companies in a consortium to to make money out of operating the Chalk River site. So it's it's been turned into a profit-making activity with huge amounts of of taxpayer money which have gone into it and which are continuing to go into it. And before it was canceled, it was like seven billion dollars. The, the, the amount of liabilities that are on the books of the Government of Canada, I think, are in the order of $7 billion. But the amount of funding that's gone to clean up those liabilities to date has maybe been 2 or $3 billion, I believe. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, 
And as of the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister just announced an, an extra over and above the existing funding that goes to Chalk River, which is like 800 million or something. They've announced an additional billion. And is it yeah. to do with that waste dump? I think so. I am not, I have, I'm not familiar with that announcement. Thank you. Well, Dee's, Dee's got one question for Oli. Angela's going to come up right now and help Kevin get set up for the next presentation. Uh, this workshop is on nuclear waste, and Kevin's going to bring us home with waste. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to realize it's coming out of our ears. Dee has a comment or question for Oli. Uh, oh, let's make you remember it. It is. Um, Oh, Brene, who you mentioned, Brene Lloyd with North Watch, um, you said she won the tour here. I received um, an email from her indicating that there's now a comment period in Canada on the government choosing the level of nuclear waste below which they're not going to regulate. In other words, it's really bad to stick it in these leaking ditches and caverns. But on the other hand, what they want to do is take the stuff that's not so, it's not going to kill you right off and give you burns and treat it like it's not radioactive. Do you know the status of that? And we in the U.S. have fought it and it's not legal in the U.S. That's a, that's a different thing. Uh, what we're talking about there is free release limits. That means that you can, you can, below a certain level of radioactivity, which is measured in becquerels per kilogram or becquerels per liter, um, if it gets below a certain legally determined and therefore arbitrary, arbitrarily l labeled limit, then it's regarded as non-radioactive and it can be dispersed into uh, landfills or it could presumably be recycled into commercial products or well, whatever. Garbage. And, and, and that's, that's the, uh, the thing, the same situation exists in Europe and this is the thing that people have to be aware of worldwide is that the nuclear industry wants to get rid of as much of this waste as they can and in order to get rid of it one helpful thing would be if they could just simply dump it i think um, it's even more insidious than that they want to get rid of as much as they can but they want there also to be some de defined nuclear waste because there's so much money to be made in the nuclear waste disposal industry now. So they're not going to declassify all nuclear no, no, waste, no. but they're going to declassify the stuff that they can't make money from and keep a classification of nuclear waste for stuff that's more compacted or easy to access and transport. And this stuff is going to get shipped all over the world to facilities like Chalk River unless unless citizens speak up and say this is not the right way to go. Okay, we need to move on to Kevin Can I ask you one good question, please? Um, thank you. Okay, brief yeah. question. Uh, does that mean we can import nuclear waste from the United States and other places to put in the safe We are already importing uh, spent uh, uh, old tritium lights Yes. From all over the United States, they go up the Chalk River and into the facility now. So yes, there's no restriction on, on waste okay. imports no, that I'm aware of. Okay. okay, we're going to move on to Kevin Camps, who's with Beyond Nuclear. He is a nuclear waste specialist for Beyond Nuclear. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. Just let me know when my hand's up. Uh, take it to the end. We're going to go right up to 3.30. We're going to go right up to 3.30, which is about 15 minutes from now. And so then we'll take questions then for the whole. Um, and at 4 o'clock, there's a general assembly. So, Kevin? All right. So, forevermore is the key word here. I heard Keegan speak way back in 1993 in my hometown. He said, electricity is but the fleeting byproduct from atomic reactors. The actual product is forever deadly radioactive waste. And when we say forever, um, NEARS and some other environmental groups like Citizens Action Coalition of Indiana sued the Environmental Protection Agency in 2002 because the EPA wanted to cut off regulations at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, the proposed national high-level radioactive waste dump from the U.S. They wanted to cut off regulations at 10,000 years, and then it was anything goes. And we said, you can't do that. It's deadly for much longer than that. So we won that court case. and. Uh, the court ordered the EPA back to the drawing board. It took EPA four years to reconfigure its regulations at Yucca Mountain. And when they did that, they came back with a million year standard. So it's the first time the US federal government recognizes that this waste is deadly 
for a million years. It's actually much longer than that. But to get the EPA to admit that? So it is forevermore, and this is another allusion to a book title by Barlett and Steele from the mid-1980s, a really great book about nuclear waste in America. It'd be funny, except it's so serious, some of the crazy stories. So for example, the WIP, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico, one of the stories they tell in here, it's the, it's in New Mexico, it's in the southeast corner of the state, it's for plutonium contaminated military waste from the nuclear weapons complex. How did that start? How it started was the mayor of Carlsbad, who was formerly a used car salesman, <laughs> read an article in the newspaper, this is all related in this book, that the US federal government, the Atomic Energy Commission, wanted to find a dump for nuclear waste, and salt was the best place. Well, they had salt down there. They had salt formations. So that's how WIP came to be decades ago. And it has leaked since, so we'll show that. And I'll skip slides that I've already shown. But the thing about it is, we were talking about reactors in the previous session. Now we're talking about radioactive waste. All of these reactor sites are de facto permanent, long term anyway, high level radioactive waste storage sites in the pools, in the dry casks. So that's not good because mega catastrophes could erupt from these pools. Uh, disastrous releases could erupt from these dry casks. So here's a typical high level radioactive waste storage pool. It's where the irradiated nuclear fuel coming out of the reactor core goes into a deep pool of water, which provides thermal cooling and radiation shielding. And this shows some workers manipulating a uh, nuclear fuel assembly, a radiated nuclear fuel assembly. If that water were not in between them and that fuel, it would kill them almost instantly. But the water provides radiation shielding and uh, also thermally cools this hellishly hot and radioactive nuclear waste. And the industry and its propaganda will, will use images like this. Nuclear fuel, you know, a handful of nuclear fuel pellets could power a city for 10 years. Well, the thing is, this is fresh fuel. This is pre-reactor. If this person were holding irradiated nuclear fuel pellets or an irradiated nuclear fuel rod, they would be dead within seconds or minutes from the gamma radiation alone coming off, like x-rays. This gives you some idea of the pellet that goes into the rod that gets bundled into an assembly. You'll have a couple hundred of these assemblies in a reactor core. After a couple, three years of being in the core, the fissile uranium 235 is largely expended. It's called spent or used. Radioactive fission products and transuranics have built up in, in this fuel. Cesium-137, strontium-90, plutonium-239, giving off deadly gamma for a millennia, at least, and then these long-lasting uh, alpha emitters that will last forever into the future. This is the International Atomic Energy Agency's warning symbol for radioactivity risks, and it is a nuclear promotional agency, but they kind of got it right on this one, I think. Get away, get far away, run for your life. Here are radioactivity risks depicted in a chart. A uh, similar chart appeared in Rosalie Bertel's classic book, No Immediate Danger? Question mark. Uh, gamma radiation can blow through you. Um, alpha radiation can be stopped by your skin, but if you have a cut on your skin, it can get in. You can breathe it in. You can ingest it in food or water. Inside, in, in the lung, it'll cause lung cancer. It may take years or decades, but it will cause lung cancer if you breathe it in. You need radiation shielding and distance between you and radioactive waste at all times, or you're in serious trouble. This shows where the different radioactive poisons go to in the human body. Another iconic image. Uh, Ole just mentioned the DGR, the Deep Geologic Repository, targeted at the Bruce Nuclear Generating Station in King Carden on the Lake Huron shoreline. This is an artist's depiction. The artist was paid by Ontario Power Generation it's hard not to show Lake Huron when you show the DGR because it's so close by. It's less than a kilometer away, but they managed to not show it. It's just off the frame. And we call it the deep underground dump, which is dud in English, which means bad idea. So this is one of the many dumps we're fighting. Uh, they also have three communities near Bruce, still in the running for the high level radioactive waste dump for all of Canada's irradiated nuclear fuel. That dud one, is for low and intermediate, just from 20 reactors in Ontario. DUD-2 or DUD-3, high-level radioactive waste from all of Canada. 
including from places like Gentil in Quebec and also Pointe La Prone in New Brunswick. Now, one of the problems with the pools, the risks, are fires that could happen if you lose the cooling water supply in the pools, whether suddenly, as by a crack in the pool that drains the water away, or more slowly, as by boiling away in an overheating incident. If you lose power to run the circulation pumps in the pool, in a matter of hours in some cases, like at Fermi 2, the pool will begin to boil. It may take days, or it may even take a couple weeks for that pool to boil dry. But as we saw at Fukushima Daiichi, as we've learned very recently, pool number four, unit number four at Fukushima Daiichi came very, very close to having a fire. It only was averted by sheer accident, by sheer luck. A gate between the reactor cavity and the pool failed. Water from the reactor cavity flooded into the pool and prevented a fire. It was a complete accident. Otherwise, Prime Minister Naoto Khan's nightmare scenario of having to evacuate 35 million to 50 million people from Tokyo and Northeast Japan may have come true. And it was through sheer luck. And that's because the pools are not inside a radiological containment structure. Reactors are, those can fail. As a it was so desperate trying to prevent this fire at Unit 4 that the Japanese self-defense forces, like at Chernobyl before, were dropping seawater onto the buildings to try to get water in those pools because they didn't know. They couldn't get close. It was deadly dangerous. They couldn't send workers in to see if there was water in the pool. So they tried to drop water in the pool. As this image shows, it didn't work. They missed the pool. The wind was blowing. But these pilots risked their lives got huge radiation doses, just like happened at Chernobyl, trying to put out the reactor fire. This use of crowd control riot cannons at Fukushima Daiichi, kind of an ironic use of a riot cannon, uh, that didn't work. What finally worked were these concrete trucks that pumped, concrete usually, but pumped water into the pools, which stabilized the situation. What are the risks? This is a scientific study by uh, two researchers at Princeton University, including Dr. Frank von Hippel, showing if a pool fire happened at the Fukushima design reactor called Point Beach, Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, Peach Bottom. Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania. Two uh, Fukushima design reactors there. This is the, the area of the United States, including Washington, D.C., including New York City, that could be impacted by radioactive fallout from a pool fire at this two-unit complex uh, on the state line between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Just off the charts catastrophic impacts possible. Another category of risk with pool storage are pool leaks of radioactivity into soil and groundwater. The most infamous of all is Indian Point, which has been leaking for at least 11 years now into the soil, into the groundwater, into the Hudson River, just upstream from New York City. Multiple pool leaks at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, owned by Entergy Nuclear, and before that by other utilities. So these pool leaks go on for a long time before they were even discovered. Here's another one that leaked uh, Connecticut Yankee on the uh, Connecticut River that then flowed into the Long Island Sound. All of that facility is now gone. It's an open field. But down hundreds of feet into the soil and groundwater is radioactive contamination from this pool leak. Another pool leak that inspired a book called uh, Memoir from an Atomic Town. Uh, the, the town is uh, in Long Island, New York. And it led to this film, this documentary. You got to see it if you haven't. It's called um, The Atomic States of America. And it's about a pool leak at Brookhaven National Laboratory, research and development for the peaceful atom, poisoning the drinking water for millions of people on Long Island. And there's, you know, off the charts, disease rates downstream from that facility. Another category of risks with high-level radioactive waste storage is dry casks. Um, that's where I got my start in this uh, anti-nuclear activism, was Palisades deploying dry casks on the beach of Lake Michigan. They're very badly designed. They're very badly manufactured. They will eventually fail over time. Maybe it'll take 100 years. Only at Palisades, they have a defective cask. It won't take 100 years. It's already defective. Uh, other places have defective casks. There's no quality assurance on the manufacturer of these things. This is uh, one design. Another one is a horizontal, up and down. This is the more common design. 
Um, they're still giving off gamma radiation to this woman, but it's within permissible levels through all those, level, all those layers of radiation shielding. I showed this earlier. This is Connecticut Yankee. You don't see anything but an open field. The contamination is invisible in the environment, but there are some 40, 50 of these dry casks out there. Here's another scary dry cask situation. Uh, Fort Calhoun, Nebraska, where the floodwaters almost overtook the dry casks, and that would cause an overheating because they're air cooled. More risks we face, parking lot dumps, what the government calls centralized interim storage, targeted at such places as Native American reservations. We worked closely with this woman, Marjean Bull Creek of the Skull Valley Go Shoots tribe, to stop a parking lot dump that was targeted at her reservation of just 125 people, and we stopped it against the, the entire nuclear industry of the United States. We just lost Marjean a few years ago. Uh, parking lot dumps, uh, Leona mentioned it earlier. Uh, the biggest threat we face right now is waste control specialists in Texas. They want to take the commercial waste of the United States, which would create mobile Chernobyls on our roads and rails and waterways. Another parking lot dump target is with New Mexico. So they're creating a nuclear sacrifice area in this small region of West Texas and Southeast New Mexico. That's their attitude towards it. We got away with so much already, we want to get away with more. What's going to stop us? We're going to stop them. We're the only thing that's going to stop them. Um, here's another place targeted, Savannah Riverside in South Carolina. And I'll just mention, in addition to what Ole mentioned, highly radioactive liquid wastes, unprecedented in North American history, perhaps in world history, to transport liquid, highly radioactive waste. It would be by truck. It would be through multiple provinces and states going to South Carolina. We have a lawsuit that's days away from being filed. From and, Chalk uh, River. From Chalk River. From Chalk River to Savannah Riverside, South Carolina. Liquid, highly radioactive waste. And this is and this is the result of medical isotope production. So don't let anybody tell you that's a clean technology. It's not. This is the shirt I have on, the Yucca Mountain issue. Um, you have to count the toes. This is the radioactive mutant zombie called Yucca Mountain that we have stopped for a generation. We will continue to stop it. Uh, Yucca Mountain belongs to the Western Shoshone Indians under the Peace and Friendship Treaty of Ruby, Ruby Valley of 1863, the highest law on the land signed by the US Congress and President Abraham Lincoln. And it's been violated with nuclear weapons testing. Now they want to dump the high level radioactive waste of the country out there. Uh, the man standing is Corbin Harney, the Western Shoshone spiritual leader who inspired and led the resistance to nuclear weapons testing in Nevada, also the dump resistance, and then seated is uh, a former chief of the Western Shoshone National Council, Raymond Yowell. And we would not have stopped nuclear weapons testing, we would not have stopped Yucca Mountain without their leadership and their inspiration for decades. All of, uh, not all of, but most of Nevada, a big chunk of California, and a part of Idaho is Western Shoshone Indian land. Yucca Mountain's in the middle of that. You can see what Yucca Mountain looks like in Western Shoshone language. The name for Yucca Mountain is Serpent Swimming Westward. And in the late 1990s, Western science caught up with the Western Shoshone. And with GPS satellites and with state-of-the-art geology, it was determined that Yucca Mountain is indeed moving westward at a very high rate. It's an area of high seismic activity, volcanic activity, if radioactive waste is ever buried there, it will leak massively into the environment, create another nuclear sacrifice area for miles and tens of miles downwind and for a vast distance in the atmosphere. This is a photo of a Western Shoshone um, sweat lodge frame um, looking at Yucca Mountain in the background. Uh, Yucca Mountain is sacred to multiple tribes and ceremonies are still held there to the present day. Here's another group of people who worship a different uh, god, and that is the nuclear god and the nuclear industry campaign contributions. Uh, this is uh, Congressman uh, Shimkus from Illinois touring Yucca Mountain, uh, trying to get it open through any means possible to him. And we've stopped him for a generation. These are dumps in Germany that are leaking. This one is a very precarious situation, Asa needs to be emptied because it's leaking so badly. You can see the floodwaters in this uh, DGR. 
And at huge risk to workers, at unimaginable expense, this dump is going to have to be emptied of its contents before they simply leak into the environment. Similar situation at another German dump that is collapsing. I, I mentioned uh, to some folks earlier today how inspired I am by the anti-dump uh, movement in Gorleben, Germany, which was the heartbeat of the German anti-nuclear movement for decades. And essentially, won the German nuclear phase out. These are the people who block roads, who block the rails to prevent high level radioactive waste from coming into their community. This is a model nuclear waste transportation container for highways that we built over in Michigan and took around the country educating people about these mobile Chernobyl transport risks. Moving this stuff is no light matter. It's very risky. You could have a mobile Chernobyl disaster in a downtown metropolitan area. It'll have to move someday from the shores of the Great Lakes and other precarious places, but you don't enter into it lightly. You don't rush into it. We call them dirty bombs on wheels. This is a German train shipment. And this is an infrared photo. You're seeing the heat coming off the waste. Uh, floating Fukushima's, we call them. Um, this is just a, a fire on a barge. It's not a radioactive waste barge, but fires happen. This could be a pathway to release radioactivity. Uh, this is a ship actually used for high-level radioactive waste transport. They can sink, whether accidentally or by attack. And I wanted to give a shout out to the Mohawks of Quebec because without their help, we would not have stopped radioactive steam generator shipments, so-called low-level waste, but intensely radioactive in their tube cores. This photo is from the top down. Uh, barges sink. This is a photo of a sunken barge underwater. Um, Bruce Nuclear had no emergency plan. Uh, actually, Bruce's CEO, Duncan Hawthorne, said at the hearings, if we had a sinking of one of these uh, radioactive steam generator boats, we would figure out what to do then. An ad hoc emergency plan. This is one of those radioactive steam generators at Bruce. You can see how big they are. They're intensely radioactive in the core. Uh, Gordon Edwards noticed that the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Bruce Nuclear, had left a radioactive isotope of plutonium off of their list of inner contents in, in the tubes. It instantly doubled the radioactivity content of these things. And they were like, whoops. Well, they, they were like, whoops, we made a mistake. Thank you for correcting our errors. This is where it would have gone on the Great Lakes. Um, Judith Johnsrud was mentioned earlier today. What is the solution to radioactive waste? Stop making it. Once it's created, there is no good answer. It's lesser evils. Uh, she has pointed out, she passed a couple years ago, that uh, this may be a trans-solutional problem. This may be a problem that humans are able to create that they are not capable of solving maybe beyond our ability to solve this one. And uh, hardened on-site storage, Dr. Arjun Makajani of Institute for Energy and Environmental Research at a event hosted by Citizens Awareness Network in 2002 coined the phrase hardened on-site storage. For the waste that exists, what are we gonna do? Keep it as close to the point of origin as possible, as safely as possible, which includes safeguarding it against attacks, securing it against leaks, designing and building the dry cast storage well enough to last, not for decades, but for centuries to come. Uh, here's a depiction by Dr. Gordon Thompson of Boston. Uh, what would this hardened on-site storage look like? And this would provide some uh, security against terrorist attacks of various sorts. And uh, that's my last slide. We've got plenty of time for questions and answers. Our next place that we have to be is at 4 o'clock General Assembly. And Gordon has the room. Yeah, I, uh, well, the county owned the, the building is called Mass, M A A S. It's the Mass building here on the McGill campus. I believe it's on Sherbrooke. Does anybody know exactly yeah, where it is? It's down, it's two buildings over that Okay, way, so so we you just down. walk down towards Sherbrooke, which is down the hill, uh, and the Mass building is room 112. And this is an important one because it's going to be talking about how we can get international action going and international cooperation on the nuclear issues. There will be a declaration which has been already prepared that groups will be asked to, uh, to uh, sign on to, uh, both in French and in English. 
uh, which calls for uh, a global network of citizen actions around the world to work together to fight this nuclear menace. Okay. Uh, so questions for Kevin. We've got 20 minutes for questions. If you've got the questions, we got, well, I wish we had the answers, but we'll try. Kevin. Yeah, just in relation to uh, dealing with the waste time, that is not going to be a passive thing. That is going to be a thing that will require constant, as though so you had an open wound that wouldn't heal, you have to constantly bandage it or change it. And it's the same thing with nuclear waste. In fact, it might be a thing that might bring people to a more sober assessment of what our future ought to be. I was remiss not to have mentioned rolling stewardship, which is yes, a, a you, phrase and a concept uh, coined by uh, Dr. Dr. Edwards. So if you'd like to speak exactly. about rolling stewardship. Well, um, the, I have a couple of uh, slides about it that I could show, but uh, maybe I could put it in there and that would be better. You could answer some questions in the meantime. Yeah, please, 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 please. Well, um, you know, back to that question there, we just lost a major court battle in um, the United States, actually yesterday. Um, we had challenged the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's nuclear waste confidence policy, which essentially said uh, to the industry, make as much high-level radioactive waste as you want, because we, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, are confident that a dump site will be found someday, somewhere, and somehow in the meantime, we will keep it safe and secure in the pools, in the dry casks. And a part of that uh, fanciful science fiction had to do with uh, dry cask storage forever at the reactor sites because there is the distinct possibility, as we've shown with Yucca Mountain, that a dump will never open. So what did the NRC say in their nuclear waste confidence? They said, we can replace the dry cask storage once every 100 years forever in the future. Forever. There's no cutoff date. And incredibly enough, the second highest court in the land, the US uh, Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, it's like, yeah, that sounds right. Human beings uh, lose institutional control in real time, let alone in centuries or in millennia. I mean, they have lost high-level radioactive waste fuel rods from certain places like Vermont Yankee and other reactors uh, out in California, um, Humboldt Bay. They have lost fuel rods. They were mistaken for something else, low-level radioactive waste shipped off-site and buried in a ditch in South Carolina. That is loss of institutional control today. And now they're telling us, they're promising, they're assuring us that they will maintain institutional control for a million years and beyond. Don't hmm. worry about it. <laughs> Except one thing is there's no funding to do that. There's no funding whatsoever to replace the dry casks every 100 years. There's no funding. So I guess they assume the US Treasury will, will take care of that at astronomical expense from now till the end of time. So you can see they're lying, and the courts just bless their lying. Wow. Well, Gordon's queuing up his uh, role in stewardship. Another question, Ol? I was curious about the parking lot in Texas. Is that high level, or? Yeah. yeah. The, the new development, what they already have at Waste Control Specialists, is a national low-level radioactive waste dump, but it's Class A, the lowest, Class B, which is worse, Class C, which is even worse. They already have that. They're burying it in ditches. They're burying it above or immediately adjacent to the Oglala Aquifer, which provides drinking water and irrigation water for numerous states on the Great Plains, all the way up to Oglala, South Dakota. And so um, they're, they're risking the biggest aquifer in the United States with their current practices of burying in ditches. Just to show how out of control this company is, they had they imported the exploding barrels from Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. I kind of ran through that quickly, but Waste Isolation Pilot Plant had a serious radioactivity release uh, Valentine's Day of 2014. A barrel burst, essentially. It exploded down there, and it got out of this dump that's 2,000 feet below the surface. It got out. Waste control specialists took 100 or more of those barrels, which are in the open air. They are sitting in the hot Texas summer sun as we speak, and heat is a problem because it could ignite the fire that bursts the barrel that releases the plutonium onto the wind. And uh, now they want commercial high-level radioactive waste. Um, I forget the quantity. Is it 40,000 tons? Um, oh, the, the 
first proposal is for, I believe, 5,000, but their plan is to, that would be a pilot plan, and they've got eight areas set aside, so the whole amount would be 40, and they've got plenty of more land that they would like to take all of the waste in the country. And just to connect U.S. and Canada, um, low-level radioactive waste in the U.S. encompasses both low and intermediate level waste in Canada. So when we say low-level waste, we mean all of it. You guys have a distinction between a lesser concentrated and a more concentrated amount. But even in your low level and in our Class A low level, you can have plutonium. You can have really long-lasting radioactivity. Thank you, Dee Diego. Uh, and she yielded her time to hold. And, and now Gordon has his rolling stewardship slides queued up. I'm just going to present it quickly. The, the idea is that uh, the industry and the regulatory agencies both want to bury this waste partly because they want to wash their hands of it. They basically want to absolve themselves from responsibility. So if they can set a timeline where they are no longer responsible for it, they say, okay, we've limited our liability, we've limited our responsibility. But they do not have a solution. They have tried to tell the decision makers that we have a solution and therefore you should give us billions of dollars to implement the solution. It is not a solution. It's a way of them absolving themselves of responsibility. So um, when you don't have a solution, you have to be honest about it. And the idea of rolling stewardship is to face up to the fact that we do not have a solution. But we do have a way of managing the waste, but we have to be prepared to make it intergenerational. And we have to make sure that what we do know how to do is to package the stuff well enough so that it's not going to get into the environment in any significant degree. And that's the important thing, is to really look after it well. So the concept of the industry is to abandon the waste. Uh, we're reading from right to left. The waste is produced in a reactor. Uh, right now we have the short term, which goes from wow to oops. Transparency, education, consultation, alternatives. This is the stuff that's stored on site. Um, then we have long-term planning, which is just a staging platform for infinity. But then they want to put it in here in, in infinitely and walk away from it. They want to say a scientific Hail Mary and tiptoe away and then hope for the best. And it's going to be the job of future generations to deal with anything that comes after that. The worst thing is that when this stuff does start leaking, the future generations are not even going to know about it. They're not even going to know what it is, how to deal with it, or whatever. And it's going to be too late to correct the situation. So rather than doing that, the proposal is to have a new policy based on frankness, where we begin by admitting that we have a pressing, no proven solution. Uh, we have to keep the stuff monitored and retrievable. And it has to be intergenerational. So that what we have is the waste they're produced, they're, they're prepared, they're packaged, but then they're, they're put into some kind of storage, but that has to go around generation by generation, perhaps on 20 year cyclic reviews. And every 20 years or thereabouts, there would be a kind of a changing of the guard. And there has to be a, an ongoing body which has the resources and the authority and the scientific know-how and the documented information about the dangers of this waste so that they can gradually improve generation by generation the way of storing and keeping this material out of the environment. This idea of rolling stewardship is to safeguard future generations for as long as is needed until there is a genuine solution, which we do not have now. We may have a genuine solution in a century, two centuries, three centuries, who knows? But uh, in the meantime, we feel this is the way to go. And that means, by the way, that the responsibility has to be transferred out of the hands of the nuclear industry. As long as this stuff is in the hands of the nuclear industry and the decision making is in their hands, they're going to be trying to make a buck out of it and they're going to be trying to use the problem to perpetuate the industry. That's what we don't want. We want to shut down the plants. That means phase out the industry, but look after the problem. And we need to address that problem as a society, as a whole society. Put that up front as an absolutely important pr uh, priority. Uh, and get new people in charge, people who are not in a conflict of interest situation. 
You heard about the acid two salt mine. They figure it's going to take 30 years to get that nuclear waste out of the acid two salt mine. And the reason it's so bad is because for 10 years, the nuclear waste were leaking. And because the people in charge were from the nuclear industry, they didn't tell anybody. And that's the same thing you're going to find with these high-level waste repositories and DGRs. If the nuclear industry is in charge, if things do start going south and going bad, they're not going to tell anybody because it's bad PR. We need to get people who are honest and who do not have a conflict of interest looking after this problem until we have a genuinely satisfactory, socially acceptable solution, not one devised for the convenience of the industry. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. Uh, housekeeping item. Um, we had a, a sign up list. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, where it's at. Or who, I took it. Okay, all right. So the, the proper person has it. So we all want to keep in touch. We're building a movement. We're building action. We're all going to keep in touch. And we'll, we'll be doing these things again. All right, so I think it's about a quarter to two. Um, are there any other questions related to waste? And uh, we do have another expert in the room, uh, D.D. Rigo on nuclear waste. So any any other issues on waste? And don't forget, two more days of workshops in this room. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, we're about 10 minutes to the hour. So let's go five more minutes, and then we'll break to get down to the. And the sign-up list uh, for the uh, our Japanese friends to endorse of the four uh, statements. Uh, is circulating as well. So please sign up. Questions? Yep, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. It's a nice and good question, but I here in Montreal, I, I, I noticed that um, the state and the business class rely more and more on it. To manage social problems and environmental problems, we see that friends in the past, like the green, were very, very serious, unremediable problems, are, are not have no, don't have any uh, hearing or voice, and it's it's forbidden to. to about this in the in Canada, for instance, ever, ever, ever. You mean the nuclear issues? Yes, and the waste and the dangers for you. And I wonder how, how if you have good experiences of facing this media blackouts, uh, the challenge is being successful. Well, there was a period of time before the phase out of the John T2 reactor, before the shutdown of the John T2 reactor. Where the media was covering it pretty well. Yes. There were a number of stories, week by week by week by week, there were stories and radio interviews and so on. The problem with social movements generally is that when the crisis alleviates, people go and do other things because they have a life to live and they have other concerns. They go back to their normal lives. So as long as there's a crisis, and the refurbishment of the Jean Couture reactor was a crisis in Quebec, and so that created media. Now there's no crisis perceivable. Now I think that, that, for example, if Quebecers knew what was happening at Chalk River, what Ola Hendrickson was talking about, then uh, they would regard this as a threat to Quebec. Also, if, if Quebecers understood what uh, what Angela was talking about with regard to the reactors and what uh, Arnie Gunderson was saying, they would realize that those reactors in Ontario are a threat to Quebec. So it's important for Quebecers to sort of get this issue, as Mark Tafari said, the way to begin is by getting your own community active, getting more people knowledgeable, and then uh, making events which will make news, which will, which will interest the, the media to want to report on it. Uh, it. It doesn't happen by itself. You can't expect the media to do the job for you. You have to do the job, create the news that the media is then going to report. And Mark Tafari and his group were very good at that. And uh, that's what we have to do, I think. I would just add, um, that comes to mind some films, like I mentioned, Atomic States of America. Another film that's just out that's specifically looking at both the low and intermediate level deep geologic repository in Kin Garden, but also these proposed high level radioactive waste dumps in places like Hornpane, 
in Ontario and even in Saskatchewan, if there's still some in the running, it's called Nuclear Hope. And it's just out. It's available through Vimeo. You can pay a few dollars and get access to the film and see it yourself. And then the filmmaker, to make a living, charges more when it's shown in a public setting. But um, it's a good film. Its, it's uh, premise is a letter to the future, sort of an apology from this generation to distant future generations. We created this stuff. We don't know what to do with it. We're so sorry. But it, it's nonfiction. That, that, I guess, is sort of fictitious. But he looks at all the problems with the proposed DGRs. Another film is uh, just out, just about to come out. It's called Containment. It's uh, two filmmakers based at Harvard University in Massachusetts. And like another film from Scandinavia that's called Into Eternity, the real focus, because it may be so fascinating for people, is how do we warn future generations about these dumps? Because they could so easily accidentally dig into them looking for something else. But a dilemma is, if you do mark the dumps to warn future generations, that's assuming that people are of good will because there's plutonium down there. Plutonium can make bombs and you can take over the planet Earth with these plutonium bombs. So there's this dilemma, and that was that Scandinavian film, Into Eternity, that interviewed just proponents of the dump, and they could not agree whether to mark it or not. That's kind of scary, when the people pushing the dump cannot agree how to proceed. And the same with containment. They look at these future scenarios. How do we warn the future against these risks that we will be abandoning? These are abandonment plans. We will sweep it under this rug. And that's something I wanted to say about these deep geologic repositories. There are some basic criteria that must be met. One is scientific suitability, that it will isolate the hazardous radioactivity forever. That's pretty hard to do. And nowhere have we found such geology yet. So that's kind of a problem, right? Maybe we shouldn't be making this stuff. A second criteria is social acceptance, or what's sometimes called consent-based siting which the US Department of Energy, probably the NWMO here in Canada, they don't mean that. It's just a public relations facade for getting their way. They're gonna dangle money in front of low-income, usually people of color communities, and hope they get away with it. That's, that's how they've behaved for decades. They're still behaving that way. And that gets into the third criteria, which is environmental justice. Ra radioactive racism is not acceptable. So if you don't have scientific suitability and consent-based siting and environmental justice, like, in my humble opinion, Native American First Nations lands cannot be targeted for these things at all. If, and these communities deserve to be, uh, deserve reparations for the abuses they've already under, experienced under hundreds of years of oppression, they should be given large sums of money to help them recover from this abuse, but not in exchange for taking the worst poison we've ever created. And these films begin to get at that. I think there needs to be more work done on the environmental justice issue, because even these films don't adequately address that. We didn't mention that the DGR in Ken Cardin, that is Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory. And they are facing a huge dilemma. You know, um, Their fisheries will be stigmatized even if the dump does not leak. People will stop buying their fish, because there's a nuclear waste dump there. If it does leak, forget about it. I think a uh, very important. It's uh, four o'clock, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's two minutes before four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, the uh, one thing that uh, very important that uh, Kevin just mentioned is that don't think of this. Don't use the word disposal uh, because we don't know how to get rid of this stuff. You know, it's not elimination of the problem. It's it's abandonment of the problem. That's the key word. Abandonment. The idea is to abandon this waste. This is not a solution. We don't run, solve a problem by running away from it or pretending you don't have the problem. That's not a solution. Um, so um, as uh, Bob has pointed out, uh, who made these graphics here, or Bob Del um, that the idea of abandonment really leads to amnesia. It means that future generations have lost their memory. They don't know what this problem is even. So when it comes back to haunt you, we've had many cases of this already, where it's come, the waste has started coming back and nobody knows what is there. Even in Port Hope, when they're digging up the remains in Port Hope, they're coming across things they do not understand what it is. Same thing in, uh, at, at uh, Sellerfield in Northern England. They're discovering stuff. They don't know how to characterize it. 
So um, the important thing about any proposal going forward is that we should have persistence of memory. We should not have amnesia. And the persistence of memory means that you have to, instead of bearing the, the prop, bearing the uncertainty, you keep that uncertainty alive by communicating to the next changing of the guard exactly what this stuff is, a very complete inventory with a complete description of the dangers of it and the dangers of the different items in that inventory. So uh, this is a, a something very important to think about. We are now, maybe, even if we exit from the age of nuclear power, the age of nuclear waste is only beginning. And going forward, people are going to have to be more alert, not less, in terms of finding out, keeping an eye on where this stuff is going and who is keeping the memory alive as to what this stuff is and where it is and how to protect ourselves against it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Of workshops on related issues but different aspects of it. So please join us uh, tomorrow and then Friday. But uh, now we're scheduled down at, for four o'clock down at the Mass building, two buildings down uh, for General Assembly. Uh, uh, I think getting a resolution on nuclear power, nuclear weapons. Capital is powerful. So, I uh, help yourself to the uh, literature on the back uh, table. Uh, you'll be there for about three days. Uh, please come back, bring your friends, and uh, get involved. Thank you.